Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations. This podcast is in partnership with Evergreen Podcast. And every week we dive into the topics of mental health, adversity, spirituality, and societal issues. I'm your host, Furkan Dandia. This week's episode, I welcome James Richardson, a PhD trained anthropologist who transitioned from academia to the business world. James shares his experiences living in India for three years and the cultural contrasts he noticed upon returning to the United States. We discuss themes of individualism, social isolation, mental health, and the impact of different cultural structures on personal development and community interaction. James also touches on his latest book, which delves into individualism as a way of life and shares insights from his personal journey and professional experiences. James Richardson is a PhD cultural anthropologist who has studied American society for 20 years as a market research consultant. Recently, he's the author of a new award-winning nonfiction book, Our Worst Strength, American Individualism and Its Hidden Discontents, where he questions our approach to individualism as a way of life. He lives in Arizona, where he writes a weekly substack, Homo Imaginary, for a growing international readership. Please check out all the ways you can find James online. And before we jump into the episode, here's a brief word for one of our sponsors. Today's episode is also sponsored by BetterHelp. Therapy can be very difficult for many people to start. In my personal experience, when I was going through my divorce, Therapy allowed me to bridge a significant gap. With the help and support of my therapist, I was able to uncover a lot of repeated patterns and behaviors that were impacting my life. Through goal setting, I was able to focus on things that required attention, which allowed me to improve the relationship that I had with myself and by extension, the relationship that I had with others. As a therapist, I've been able to see the positive benefits that clients are able to derive through healthy rapport and goal setting. BetterHelp allows a lot of flexibility where clients can schedule video sessions, sessions on the phone, or through messaging. In most cases, BetterHelp will match you up with a licensed therapist within 48 hours. If that's not a good fit for you, BetterHelp will work with you to find the right fit. Join over 4 million users today by following the link in the description or going to BetterHelp, that's H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash easy10 to get 10% off your first month of therapy. James, welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. Really excited for our conversation. We've been able to chat about some of your journey and where you're coming from and what you'd like to discuss in terms of the interests you have. But yeah, we're wanting to explore a lot of things today. So We'll just jump right into it, but just to give the listeners a bit of context, I'd like to give you an opportunity to share with us a little bit about yourself and what's brought you here today. Thanks, Furkan, for having me on the show. I am a PhD trained anthropologist. I left academia early and I entered the business world (laughs) for the sake of salary. And I had a passion, I think, from a young age for that sort of led me to get my anthropology doctorate for understanding social life, the things that confuse me about social life specifically, which is a lot because I'm high functioning (laughs) on It took me a little longer than most to get socially fluent. And so I have a new book that is a a lifelong project of exploring individualism as a way of life. And and, I I lived in India for three years during my graduate research, and that helped. It helped me personally a lot. We can get into that. But I think it just helped provide this lifelong contrast that there's a totally other way of living. It's not better or worse, just very different. And that, I think, is the inspiration for why I'm here on the show is because I when I came back from that cultural immersion, I went through a lot of culture shock and I settled down. I got a career and I did all the things that you're supposed to do. I did them late, later than most people. And I went through my own mental <laughs> crisis. Yeah. Um, 
And we'll talk a little bit about that, I'm sure. But the book is, <laughs> it probably is a healing act, but I didn't really think about it conscious. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my intro. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. So right off the bat, I guess one of the things I'm curious about is, you know, you talked about the cultural contrast that you experienced in India. Are you able to shed some light from your perspective on what you noticed there and why was it such a shock coming back to the United States? I would say the biggest, the biggest dimension of culture shock was when I came back and then essentially started to reestablish an apartment, right? This classic sort of young adult thing that, that people do when they're single. I had this transition. I had a soft landing with my family, so I, had, I, hung, I had to do some local research at a library. So I was with them for about two months. After I got out of the soft land, I, I was thrown full face back into the incredible alienation of just being a single adult in a town that you were not born in, which you don't have a, like a native social network in. Like a lot of post-grad people, we move around a lot for school and other things. And so you're not, you're often perpetually in a community that you don't actually have any deep social roots in. It's pretty common. So to go from India where I felt like I always had someone to talk to, I don't know if they knew me, they didn't know me, but there's always somebody to talk to. Just the distracting power of social interaction is underestimated, I think, because it distracts you from rumination, overthink, um, things that introverts like me tend to do if left alone. Right. Or anyone, yeah. but really me. And I think we could call it loneliness. And yes, that's what it felt like. But I think that it's just the lack of someone to, the fact that it was, it's like an effort in America to go find. Yeah. It's an effort. It's a project to go find someone to talk to. Here like, is, yeah. Yeah. So w what I'm hearing is like, you we're on your own there when you came back and you experienced a sense of isolation, whereas in India, it wasn't that the case because you could actually carry on conversation with other people. Do you feel that's a reflection of the collectivistic culture versus the more individualistic culture in the Western world, perhaps, if we were to look at it on a macroscopic level? Do you think that's the difference there or is there more to it? That I, yeah, I actually think it has to do with the concept of the stranger. And I don't know that perfectly lines up with that continuum you just mentioned. Yeah. Someone may have studied that. I don't know, but the, the way that str cultures and societies that are just, where the average person is more embedded in their family and is more into community tend to process strangers very different. And, and it's not, this isn't necessarily a good thing. I don't, for anyone who's been to, to where, India, doesn't matter where in the country, but if you, as a, cause you're going to, you're probably marked as a foreigner, either with your clothes or your skin color. And so you go in and people are going to start processing you. People will come up to you and, and demand to know what's going on. At, at the very least, all eyes will be on you. And that, when that happens, man, you don't forget something like that. When that happens the first time in your life, like mm -hmm. hundred people staring at you as you walk down the street. And so that processing of the stranger it leads to a quick, it's like a quick choose your own adventure. And, and basically they're going to find a place to place you. They're going to position you, whether you like it or not. The funny thing is that actually makes talking and conversing and interacting so much easier. Yeah. It just makes it effortless, absolutely seamless. Contrast what it was like coming back to it, uh, the U.S. and living as a single person where, I mean, I think we're all, tacitly aware of this you could just I, you could just wander around in circles all day and no one would say anything you could just circle your apartment block like infinitely and i don't think anyone would even notice you're doing something so weird let alone actually say anything unless you do something else that looks vaguely threatening non-western cultures not all of them but most of them actually it's not really about india it has nothing to do with that if you go into any rural community in the world is probably very similar even in the u.s and canada but it's going to be, they're going to suck you in. And, and so they got to figure out who you are, what the deal is and how you fit in. And that's the sign of a tighter community. They just want to understand how you fit in. And more hyper-individualistic societies like ours, it's just, we create, 
we believe so much in the shield of extreme individual privacy that the public isn't allowed to really inquire what you're doing until you get super weird. Mm. Basically, it has to be threatening. Yeah. If you're walking around your block in circles, most people probably won't notice that because there aren't eyes on the street here. Now, if you yeah. walk up and down, you start opening it, trying to open everybody's car door, people might notice that. Right. Yeah. So it's what you're identifying is once you present yourself as a threat, that's when it becomes an issue. Now I'm right. wondering, and again, I can't really understand your lived experience, but I am curious to understand from your perspective, like being in India, obviously there's a lot of history with uh, imperialism and colonialism, especially yeah. from the British empire. So they do have a bit of a visceral reaction from my understanding when they see someone of your color. I'm wondering, did that factor in at times for you? And how was that an experience also? That increased the likelihood of them positioning me mm -hmm. like a circus freak, basically. Yeah. The, the funny thing is it was mostly positive, overwhelmingly. Mm -hmm. I actually, and many people will tell you this, like when you embed in a community, generally you get treated like a VIP. Despite colonialism, it's very ironic. Yeah. So uh, to me, it was, once you get over the fact that everyone's staring at you all the time, when that just encourages you not to go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you just hang out in your local hood. <laughs> it's all the staring stops and then you, know, you just become some local oddity. But never had a problem talking to people or finding someone to talk to. And I think that just the power of easy sort of chitty chat the ease with which you can do that in, in, in more hyper-connected societies is there's such a mental health benefit. I've told, I said this on another show, like my mental health was fantastic while I lived in India, but I, and I was almost killed three times, like physically attacked twice. But my mental health baseline was so much better because mm. I had constant interaction. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a neurology where I will literally just read books all day unless someone says something. It's just, I will disappear. If I just tried to hide, if I had done an experiment, hide in my apartment, people would have started banging on the door. And that just wouldn't have happened in Madison, Wisconsin as a graduate student. Like I probably could have been dead for at least a week in my room. Mm. If I, I, that to me, that, as a social scientist, but also just as a human being, that is just extremely disturbing contra because I don't think we understand that the way we've set up the rules here, we have to work to maintain our social network. In traditional human societies, the network is constantly regenerating itself every second. Right? Yeah. It's not like you become alienated. Oh, I got really busy and I didn't get in touch with my friends. Now I will reconnect with my friends. This is completely a Western problem. This is a totally arbitrary, we don't have to live like, <laughs> yeah. we don't want, but we do. And I didn't realize how bad the problem was until I came back. So it, my mental health was a lot better in India, like significantly better. When I came back, I had much more self-awareness. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I actually, I really have to work hard to make friends, to sustain to insert myself into social life. I've got to constantly fight to be in social life. Mm -hmm. And I did. I did by doing it. I started joining activities like swing dancing that would force me into social rhythm. And that was my big takeaway from India. It was like, America's not going to do it for you because nobody cares. So you're going to have to force that. And it's not the end of the world. You can figure it out. Yeah. But you can't. You can't just be in school and expect these things to happen. It just doesn't, we don't have, as I say in my book, we don't have a structured process for young adults to become full-fledged adults. There's no ritual. There's no nothing. It's right. basically a giant free flow. Mm -hmm. Right. A bunch of people do really well. Right. You're fine. Yeah. So it's fairly arbitrary from what you're saying there. And some of the cultures like India, they have more of a rate of passage for individuals to get into that adult. Earlier, you mentioned the impact it had on your mental health, and you talked about some of the ways you were able to navigate that when you were in the United States again. But what was going on with your mental health? So I know you touched on the isolation piece and make, really having to make an effort to socially integrate. But yeah. What was going on with the psyche 
in that sense? I would say my nadir <laughs> was actually career related more than did I feel like socially integrated because I, I chose the path. I chose a path that was academic. And so it's not the difference between trying to become a writer. It's basically an entire, it's a self-invented identity. It's all about you what convergence of luck you can manufacture. And I think the connection to what we we're just talking about was that I got, I hit my second major depressive sort of episode in my life, basically right after I got my PhD approved. <laughs> it's just like literally my anticlimactic gift was depression. I already knew that I was going to have to leave academia because my advisor was not on my side. There was no go. And I think my experience in India, I hadn't been a therapy yet, so I was winging the self-analysis, which is never a great idea, by the way, if you can possibly get professional conversation help. The conclusion I came to is that I had, and I wrote about this in my book, that I had failed in graduate school to be a power network, right? The people getting jobs in oversupplied fields are people who are networking masters. Right. It's actually no different than business and other sectors, right? When there's too many talented people who are all on the same level of talent and can contribute the same thing to the field, then it becomes a completely superficial high school game. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm high functioning autistic, so I don't do superficial high school game. I just run. Right. Or, or I get really angry, to be honest. Like I I do both. And I did. I so I went through a period, this is, and I think very common, I mean, much more common than mental illness of a clinical nature, but just a classic depressive period where I had to grieve somehow dysfunctionally the, that I had to walk away from a career I had spent the last 15 years obsessing. And that, I did not process the grief around, I didn't recognize it as grief. I recognized the anger and all I wanted to do was re redirect the anger and get beyond that. Probably that was a healthy motive, but I didn't ever deal with the grief. That affected me for the next five years as I tried to integrate into the business world because everything became a comparison between what I was, this work I'm doing for corporate America versus what I could have been doing. Just mm -hmm. constant, unhelpful. And that's what happens when you don't grieve a career loss. Is you're constantly, you're still back there. Half of you still back there trying to make it work. And the other right. half is badly adapting to the new reality. And you talk about something where there's no structured help in Western society. It's like probably the most critical one in terms of mental well-being is there is absolutely no new ritual for career or employment. There's nothing. And yet this is happening to millions of people a year. That's what puts me away. Right. This is not some like weird case of PhD. It, it's happening in every... It, could, it happened in COVID because people had to go take care of their parents and then their career employers. And did they ever, did they grieve the loss of the career caused by their family care duties? I don't know. I hope so, but I doubt it because we don't have a society that's actually monitoring everybody's mental well-being. I had, when I lived in India, I had people commenting on my mood all the time. And my mood as an American and someone who's autistic, it's very roller coaster. So I can be difficult to live with and be around even here, but they would tell me. They would comment. Yeah. And that's an invitation to share. Yeah. But if you, but in our society, in our social setup, you could spiral, you could be in that spiral and put on a mask for months and yeah. months. And again, so I don't want to pry. Mm. Wanna... Either because you don't want to hear or you don't know what to say is actually the problem. Right? Yeah. 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 No, that's, it's an interesting dichotomy that you're sharing here because most of the time we can make the argument that places like India, again, that's the example we're using here, um, perhaps don't have the same level of awareness and understanding when it comes to health. They're perhaps lacking a little bit or uh, lagging for that matter. It's the Western world talking more about mental health, more at the forefront, people's conscious awareness. But there are certain things that we do socially that can affect or have a verse effect actually on people's mental health in the Western world versus 
places like India where people are more tuned with other people's emotions. So that's something you had mentioned to me as well was this whole idea yeah. of emotionally intelligent culture there. But that on paper, that might not be the case. And that's not something people would historically talk about, right? That's not something. So that, I think, yeah. Yeah, this is not my area of expertise. There are medical anthropologists I know who study cross cultural dynamics in great detail. But I can riff on what I've read about. And I can say that what you're getting to at generally, classical civilizations in, in the Eastern world generally have been slow to deal with severe psychiatric illness. So when you go down into that particular rabbit hole, we have better solutions. Most of them are pharmacological. We're talking about, I have an aunt who's bipolar. So I, I have some explanation well, to what, you know, that's, that, those are that, very rare know. illnesses, right? Like what I just described to you, which is career loss, grief, that's essentially a mass phenomenon in a way. It's going to happen to more than half the population in their working life. Something's really bad in their careers going to happen. And they're going to have to grieve that and deal with it. And what's interesting to me is that if, if crudely put, put, if like South Indian culture is really good at keeping people connected and monitoring baseline, then the world, which may or may not, it should not require a professional therapist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to achieve that baseline. The fact that we, like you have a career and that other people have a career in this field, and I use therapists, they're valuable, is an adaptation to a system that puts ridiculous stress on the individual. I, I, that's my personal belief is that it's a positive functional adaptation to a problem caused elsewhere in the structure right. of society. Yeah. I'm not sure that the average South Indian person needs therapy, to be right. honest, right? If they're in functional family community, because their baseline is probably doing a lot better. Yeah. yeah. I can't show you data, but I could point listeners to studies that have been done of the Amish communities in the U.S. who we have better access to because they receive things like state aid and other things so they can go in and pry and do study. <laughs> but they have found that Amish, like Amish women have much lower rates of depression, anxiety than the average American woman in the United States. Do you feel like um, that's a it, by orders of magnitude that are way beyond the margin of error, right? Yeah. And you can relate that to the structure, predictability, greater degree of certainty in their way of life. And I guess my follow-up question is, do you feel that's a product of the simplicity of life too, right? Because you can argue in the more rural areas, we tend yeah. to have a bit more stress, right? More work. We tend to work more hours. We've got more bills, more materialistic things that are stress-inducing. So I wonder how much of that is a product of the lifestyle we tend to live as well. Yeah, and I when I did... The seventh chapter of my book was, it may actually not be that interesting to most of my readers. I have no way to survey them yet, but it was my, the one of the most interesting for me to write because I did a social history of household expenditure. It was a wonderful document that Congress put together comparing data from 1900 and, and 2021. And so when you look at what people are spending on and how ex baseline expenditure of housing has gone up. When you adjust for inflation and households, the per capita spending on housing has gone up in 120 years. The food expenditure has gone down. Hmm. But then we've added things like insurance. Didn't even exist. That wasn't even a line item, right? right? So our lifestyle is more expensive, even for this most struggling working class person. It's more expensive to sustain what we think of as north. That to me is a classic logical case of a what would it, in sports they'd call it an unforced error so you don't have to do that you don't have to make these assumptions right your suffering is caused by assumptions that you are making about how to live and to your point we live the urban people live in a media verse which is basically just drowning them in alternative choice which to the human mind it, humans are wired to make hierarchical comparisons so it's not an innocent thing to flood your screens with alternative lifestyle choices. Your brain, whether you're aware of it or not, is going to start to say that's better or worse how I live now. That's a better or worse activity. I should add that activity. Or I'm better than that person doing that. Activity. Everything becomes hierarchical and imperative. And it, that's exhausting. It is cognitively exhausting. 
And I've noticed just as smartphones, because I was on smartphone super early, because my old boss just, he bought some er first gen iPhones and gave So I got sucked into this screen garbage really fast. And I, it just, it was amazing to me how much more choice was presented on a daily basis. Right. To didn't ask for it. Don't care really. But you see, the problem is it doesn't matter if you care. It's there. Yeah. And it's just, and we're trained and we're sucked into video. Mm -hmm. I think that's a human thing. We're really, video is so much more powerful, a distracting force. But that choice issue becomes important because if you live in a society that's not constantly presenting you a lot of choice, your decision flow during the day, there's a lot fewer decisions you're making. You're not shutting out as much noise. A related story, I mean, I had, there was a kid I was friends with in the community in South India I lived with who had come from, he would basically come from the village, was doing this classic thing that you do in when you're trying to get out of rural poverty, which again, poverty is relativistically defined to an urban standard. You got to take that with a grain of salt. Like this is God, not a guy who's starving, right? Not a malnourished tribal person in the mountains of India. These, he was stable. There was a family, they had land, there was a life. He wanted to become something, what he thought was superior, make more money by coming to urban India in the city where I was living and have a go at it. And it was a lead to that. And in India, when, because I think it's actually worse than here, but I haven't, there's no way for me to quantify it, but I suspect it's worse. I think there's a deeper shame about the individual going into the city and failing there. And so the amount of, the depth and expansiveness of the lies were unbelievable. <laughs> I, and it was, and at first I thought these people were like sociopaths. I know like, this is actually a cultural reaction to the failure because their family probably isn't rooting for them. Someone in the family. No, <laughs> you The I told you so crap. Yeah. Whatever it is, there was just an inability to deal with reality that this is not working out. And I think I, there, I did hear stories of people who just go back. And, and that never gets written about in Indian, in the Indian press, in Indian media, nobody's studying. People go and say, you know what? It wasn't so bad. Again, yeah. I'm not talking about malnourished, low caste Dalits or people like that who are actually like being abused. I'm talking about probably people from the landowning caste who going into the city trying to make a better life for themselves. They find it wasn't that bad, right? Because if they're ever actually able to dance between two extreme worlds that most Americans don't have access, they can't do that with one bus ride. They just don't. And I felt it too when I was there doing field research. I could go one hour out from the city and it was like, oh. I might as well put in like Northern Thailand, like in the mountains. It's crazy. So I think that when the individual sticks their neck out in a society with, and tries to stand out, it takes actually more force in a country. It takes more force of will than it does here. It's really easy to escape here. If you don't, if you just have some desire to upgrade your life, like my dad developed at the end of his high school. It's extremely easy to abandon your family and just disappear. It's not as easy in other cultures. Right. They will come find <laughs> What is going on? What are you doing? So hence, maybe that's the explanation for all the lying. Because you, you got to keep them from... <laughs> There's all this surveillance, right? Like, how you doing? How's it going? In the apartment, there's the constant surveillance. So you're going to have to constantly do smoke and mirrors. Yeah, and I can I could tell from the outside how incredibly stressful that was, and I think so. Trying to be hyper individualist in a country like India is actually very different. It happens. There's tons of people like that. It's a totally different context, a very different game. I can't sit here and applaud it though, because people, a lot of people, are just driving themselves into ditch. So that's one way you can become mentally unwell in India really fast. Right. <laughs> and I don't know that you see the same dynamic because escaping your family and doing better is coded as a positive thing here. So you don't have to do the smoking it right. nearly as much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can literally not call them. For sure. <laughs> yeah. just... No, and I appreciate that. And I think just it's important to discern between the two and then obviously pros and cons with both. But the other thing we touched on, especially in the Western world, access to therapy 
and psychiatrists, as, as you're talking about, you know, we're talking about a lot of solutions, pharmacology. So that can also have unintended consequences. Now, another unintended consequence I do want to talk about is the this notion that we tend to then become a victim. And, you know, now we've been given all these tools to seek out help, but it's very easy to internalize a victim mentality mm-hmm. and feel like a victim in your story because now you have people who are supporting that world. Whereas in some of the cultures, like going back to India, you don't necessarily have that luxury because everyone around you is pulling up their bootstraps together and getting to work. You don't have the time to be a victim. And if you do, you often tend to get isolated from that culture or isolated out of whatever structure you're a part of. Because again, like I said, you don't have the time to be a victim. You have to keep moving on or just fall behind. Whereas here, you can see tendency nurturing that in a sense. Yeah, I my brain is immediately going to this family that I became very close to in, in uh, the community I was doing research in. And they actually, they were Dalits, but they were, the dad was like a Dalit activist. And mm-hmm. so he was very much into his victim identity. Like he dressed in it every day and he would use it as a weapon. It was not effective. All it did was alienate his children and himself from everyone around him. So you can find that in India, and I'm just struggling to understand, it just never occurred to me to compare. And I think the answer may be very simple, is that if you, if your path to social mobility in India is based on trying to engage in a victim identity-led fight, actually the landlord, caste landlords of your natal village in your head or a city, this is, the, this is a dysfunction that's very indie. Right. <laughs> the guy's not even there. He got out. Yeah. No, you, to, a, to an objective social scientist, it's just, my God, you're actually not doing that bad. <laughs> but it's not for me to judge whether someone should, has been victimized. <laughs> Have you been victimized? So I was, when I was working with their family, I could sense both sides of the critique. Like, see, he was basically a whiner. He was a local whiner. But I saw it a little differently. I saw him having a dysfunctional reaction to various classic social forces right he was he had been brought into the city but he was never going to go anywhere as a dublin he he had his little government job but that was never going to turn into anything right i think he had to him the city was a place where he could get the government job government pension and then suddenly i think he he had a fantasy that this hell from the village would just disappear no it just reproduces so differently in city in a way he was a really angry guy who did not agree with his issue but his issue was very urban and modern and so that's, that's, so I agree with you that getting trapped in a victim mentality, I don't care what social position you're coming from, if you actually get trapped in that and you're only processing the world from the perspective of what has been done to me, you're actually just living in the past, right? So you can't actually affect, you can't put a plant. Yeah. However, there are, you know, people from really what I would say abused and stigmatized subcultures, which is part of my specialization in social science, they're, they don't have a, the average person doesn't have a, a role model of someone who's gotten past. So I can't from the outside ju- judge them for have being a victim, whatever, I don't know the term, but being obsessed with their victim identity. I don't feel like I can judge those people because they've never had a role. I, when I've had setbacks in my life, um, I've had a role model and I've seen people, I've heard the stories, right? And I, I think that so easy to underestimate, I would imagine, especially as a clinician, if you're working with people who are coming from those backgrounds. If they don't have a role model, this becomes a much more challenging clinical task to actually talk them into hope. Yeah. Because why do they have any hope? Yeah. Statistically, they yeah. show me the numbers. <laughs> yeah. But whereas it's easier for me to convert from basically whining to hope. And I think it's, it's a natural response. It's a natural response. Yeah. Playing the pitiable victim for a very short period of time is an ancient human way to invoke the community. It's a, car, it's a cry for the community to come in. So I don't have a problem with that. I think what we're talking about is when it gets really, it just becomes an obsessive, it becomes your lifestyle. 
And my therapeutic breakthrough was related to that. It's not very impressive from a victimization standpoint, but it doesn't really matter for the individual. But you have to get past your own BS. And so for me, it was the inability to grieve the abandonment of the academic career. Yeah. And that took me, I had to get, I had to get that up to the surface and just deal with it and deal with my, with some other weaknesses that I have had as a person and still have, which is related to social skills. I had to take that as serious, as a serious challenge. I couldn't, I couldn't be 32 and pretend that social skills deficits are not my problem. Sorry, right. not my problem. Yeah. I know that sounds ridiculous to some listeners, but, but this is the alienation that people are allowed to, that they're allowed to get to 32 without. Taking that seriously is the point of my book, right? Is that you can create this little lifestyle bubble for yourself and just avoid all sorts of things other people consider normal. Mm -hmm. And that can drive you into a real dip. Yeah. And people won't enter. Because they don't know. Right. When I was corrected all the time behaviorally in India. It, it, and as an American, it, it really pissed me off in the beginning. Yeah. I was just like... You don't even know me. Don't comment on my personality. Go away. Right. And it's, it wasn't really actually a personal thing. This was just a, this is what the, a communal society in a functioning neighborhood. So it does. Mm -hmm. and do you feel like that serves a purpose in building resiliency? Because if yes. people don't give you that immediate feedback, you tend to develop blind spots. And yep. yeah, in fact, you become very rigid in your blind spots. And then the second you realize that maybe you're doing something wrong or something doesn't go your way as an adult, you don't have the resilience or the ability or the openness actually to be able to in, in, incorporate that feedback the world is offering. Whereas that direct feedback perhaps can help you shape yourself earlier. Now, again, it depends on your temperament and your personality, right? And your ability to accept that feedback. But at some point, if it happens often enough, especially in that cultural standpoint, then the choice is yours, right? Like either you want to fit in or you want to be isolated and then that's conscious choice you're also making. Yeah, I think related to what you're saying, I've always felt, and I've experienced it myself, I think in America, especially, perhaps Canada as well, there is a real hard time. Urban people have a hard time distinguishing personal feedback and I don't know that we actually can figure it out. Right. And we actually, the way that we interact with each other actually works against getting the, and we don't have rituals to do. So my, my favorite punching bag here is the one-on-one -on -one performance. And I've had them. I'm not, I didn't just read about it. And as a social scientist, I would go through and I'm like, this is so bizarre. Right. It's like some of this stuff, as you're getting the feedback, you're like, why didn't you just come into my office and talk? <laughs> but yeah. why didn't you, yeah, but why did you wait for That was first thought. Second thought was, you're claiming in front of me that there's all these people, like in my case, who don't, didn't want to work with me because they found my personality too difficult. But they as a group didn't come in and talk. But apparently that's anathema. I guess we don't think about it. Yeah. But you know what? Properly structured, that would have been highly effective. Let's see, we don't do that. In an individual society, every problem is turned into an individual level problem. I like guess the problem started with you and the solution is with you. Right. And I think the problem with a lot of the debate around victimhood, and I wrote a Substack piece on this, is that the problem with victim, the victim identity is that the solution to whatever got you there emotionally has nothing to do with the victim perpetrator accident. That has to be grieved and moved beyond. Then you can step to the right or left and work on personal transformation, whatever it is, so that you can better adapt to the world that basically just screwed. You don't have to deny that there are external forces. You can't sit there and wallow in it. Yeah. And then just sit there and whine. Yeah. But the problem is that people don't actually grieve. And so what they're doing is they're fighting with the perpetrator as they try to adapt and find a solution. That's where you get it. Like the guy in India talked about who just everything was big. Every problem in his life is because he's untouchable. Right. Yeah. Even though most of his problems were self-created. Yeah. Do you feel like the social structure then 
also plays a role in, in enabling that victim mentality because you and I also chatted about affirmative action, right? So feel yeah. affirmative action falls into this and the role that plays in enabling some of these behaviors or, or the mindset around being a victim. Yeah, I find the, what's happened to that movement to be tragic and it, some of it was foreseeable. I, I think when I was at Harvard, which is a perfect, in the early 90s, it was a perfect laboratory to see what traditional affirmative action was yielding at elite colleges. And what I found was that it was really good at getting highly privileged folks from minority backgrounds access to superior education. Right. Uh, which was, quite honestly, historically relegated to you know, Boston Brahmins and the like. The people, in other words, the people I was meeting on Harvard campus who were from um, disadvantaged minority groups actually were not socially disadvantaged people. So they did well. It was like they got a lot out of it. They, they milked it. It was very useful for them. But they, I don't know that their social advantage changed much by going to Harvard. Like, yeah. like, so I was sitting there going, this is great. Wait, what was the problem we're solving? <laughs> it was like, that's what I was thinking. Wait, what was the problem we're solving? Oh, the problem was, is enhancing opportunity for underprivileged people. Okay, yeah, and that does statistically correlate with certain racial groups. Okay, then why would you wait till they're 18? Now, this is a huge debate. Yeah. Because where do we intervene to, to boost up um, opportunity amongst the disabled? Talk to any early childhood educator and they'll tell you kindergarten. It's over. Most of class mobility is determined by what's going on at that age. That's the reality. There are people who, like my dad, who pull it out of their behind because they're super high aberrant IQ. So that's also not an interesting case. Though. So we've got a system where the high IQ from disadvantaged backgrounds, whether you're black or white, probably will find a way. Right. And that's distracted us from the fact that we're not actually spreading the opportunities properly. And we're actually waiting to do it at, at college. Maybe. It's a very elitist view that you would solve the problem at college. So what totally hearing, misses the point. What I'm hearing from you is that at that point, it's too late. Yeah, you're not going to be, you're not reaching underprivileged people. Right. Um, you aren't. They may be African-American, but they're not. And that's not what I saw. Yeah. But then and, that, goes, that goes to the debate of equal opportunity versus quality of outcome, essentially. Yeah. And I think that's a, when no one wants to have that debate openly, <laughs> but that's the, no, but that's really what, People are still talking past each other all the time. Right. I don't think America, most Americans don't want to live in a society forcing equality of outcome because that is a hard socialist state. Right. I don't think most people really want to sign up. And equality of opportunity, I think everybody's on, most people are on board with it. And, and that was the original intent right. of the EEOC of urban action was get more opportunity, but you're waiting till they're 18 because you're presuming that the way to boost people from poverty is to hand them a college degree. That is literally... One of the most myopic yeah. assumptions that people made, people who look like me, who made, you know, in the 50s and 60s. And I guess they were doing their best, but it wasn't based on a lot of research. So we're smarter and better researched now. Right. But the funny thing is we're not really, we're not succeeding at all in preschool. Though. Yeah. And I think unintended consequence there is it leads to a sense of entitlement as well, which we're seeing play out. And that's causing a lot of issues as well as well in, in this current social structure. Yeah, I think what I find tragic too is if you've got people who are not, their life would have probably, their class position would have probably panned out just fine not going to Harvard, to yeah. be honest, as would have mine. The, who become the defenders of something that was actually designed for people in a very different way. And so the social outcome the program was chased, was interested in is not really being served in an honest manner. And, and there are people gaming the system. I had a dorm mate who sat at dinner in the dining hall and literally she was ha she's half Bengali and half Latino. And she literally actually, I, I was not very nice, but I, she actually sit across and she's literally talking to us like, how do I fill out my grad school application? Which one do I pick? And me being an on kind of an aspie jerk, I basically said, well, it's a game. 
This is a game. So you pick the most disadvantaged identity. Play the game. Which she thought was way too cynical a comment. Yeah. You're talking about somebody who's the daughter of a surgeon. I'm just sitting there going, the fact that she was bringing it up as like some neurotic thing, well, I'd want to strangle her. I'm like, do you realize like the thousands of people were never held in kindergarten who could be also filling out the app? Yeah. So anyways, it, it's a, I think people forget that some component of affirmative action is absolutely a power struggle and that's just say it, it is. And I don't think that's bad. But the, we try to hide behind them. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. These are historically abused, disadvantaged groups, right? So when once a slice of people get educated, they're going to, you know. But we have to distinguish the power seeking from, are we actually spreading opportunity? Yeah. And, and the is historically, it's always been there, right? So it's not yeah, something. It's human behavior. Where we're. Being naive and we're in fact deceiving ourselves if we say that we're not addicted to or, or enticed by power. The other irony for kind of the whole affirmative action thing is what, where are we trying to intervene? It's not just 18 years old, but the assumption is so individualistic. It will intervene when you're 18 and we'll help you with your individual ju educational journey. Right. Make sure your CV looks great. Yeah. For this individual society, you need to thrive in. So it fits in totally that the assumptions make sense to me, but they're not how a real communitarian like policy world would actually think if it existed. Right. It would yeah. be thinking much more like the early childhood educational team. It's like, hey, we lose these kids at kindergarten, all right? Because if they're so, if their home life is so messed up that they can't even pay attention in kindergarten, it's over. Right. They will take four grades to learn how to read, and then it's all down. And then someone raises their hand and says, well, why'd they join a gang? I don't know, because you didn't support them. And they were, that's why. But see, we don't want to accept that. It's a terrifying set. That really terrifies people to admit the level of neglect we allow to go on in these communities. So it's a lot easier to focus over here. College applications, let's help people there. Except that that's, that can be game. Mm -hmm. Then do. Yeah. James, I think we've uh, explored quite a bit. Uh, I think we've highlighted quite a few things here. And uh, I think this has been quite the conversation. Definitely has given me a lot to think about. But uh, I appreciate you sharing your personal story and some of, some of the experiences you've had and what the learnings you've had from those experiences in terms of. It's always interesting to contrast different cultures and, and see what comes out. So appreciate your view on all of that. Now, for listeners that want to find your work, I know you referred to your book and your Substack, but what are some ways they can find all of that? If you go to jamesrichardson.substack.com, that's the landing page for my publication. That's an easy place if you want to. More essays that I, that I write, I write them every week easy snack size conception. If you really want to ruin a weekend, <laughs> you can buy this 480 page monster here in which you will be given a grand cultural tour of how individualism works in everyday life. That's on Amazon. Okay. Our worst strength. Type it into the search bar. It will, it will pop up. Perfect. Put all of that in show notes, but thanks again, James. This was a great conversation. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks. Thanks for having Thank you for checking out this episode with James. As always, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. That's the best and easiest way to support this podcast. And on Apple and Spotify, you can leave up to a five-star review. These reviews are appreciated and really help us improve the quality of the show. You can also check out the sponsors in the description and evergreenpodcast.com for their network of podcasts including easy conversations. And finally, please subscribe to the Easy Reflections newsletter, a zero-cost newsletter that goes out weekly, where I talk about different mental health topics and provide practical insights and tips for the reader. Thank you again, and until next time.